week we began a new series, it's a three-part series, bringing Christ's hope, bringing Christ's love to the hurting. And last week's message was getting our bearings. The main point was hold on to what's true. Scripture is true. Excuse, uh, causes are no excuse. And then our words can hinder. Today, the title of the message is Clearing the Fog. And the main point today is the truth sets us free. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11, it's the text I'll be using all three weeks. Next week we conclude. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor no adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. We could add to that list. No liars, no lustful at heart, no gossipers, no one who's proud. Amen? And such were some of you. That's the most important point of this whole series. And such were some of you. Meaning that people have committed all these sins and still, because of Christ, can come to God in heaven. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Isn't that some reason to celebrate? Father, give me your words. Help me, Lord, to preach this and share this and teach it in the Spirit. We ask, Lord, that in Jesus' name you would bind all forces of darkness that would bring hindrance, that would bring confusion, bring people's walls down. Help us to hear what it is your Spirit is saying to the church today. Sanctify this room as a place of worship for the conclusion. We ask if you would even, Lord, stretch out your mighty right arm for salvations, for healing, for breakthrough, Lord, for peace and refreshing, and for understanding, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. You can be seated. Last week was really emphasizing love. This week I have to emphasize humility. Oh, a number of years ago, before Governor Como passed the same-sex marriage law in, in New York State, there was a move in our nation to try to have a marriage amendment passed, saying that marriage is between one man and one woman. And in those days, I spoke pretty passionately in these services about the amendment. And I alienated a couple of families. And since that time, the Lord has taught me quite a bit. I'm still learning, unfortunately still making mistakes. But he's taught me to have greater compassion. And he also introduced me to this subject matter. So I've been teaching it for the last several years and bring it to you today. Alan Chambers writes, most people dealing with strong same-sex attractions struggle with shame and a fear of being fully known. I said last week, there are many of us who are afraid of being fully known. Being fully known means being transparent, allowing people to see our fears, our weaknesses, our hopes, and our dreams, and not being embarrassed by them. And many of us here walk with shame. But shame should not be part of the Christian life. Jesus' blood cleanses us from all unrighteousness. He will heal our hearts. He forgives our sin. And he loves us unconditionally. Randy Thomas writes, Men and women with same-sex attraction can and should know that God knows them by name and looks upon them with great compassion and love. God also knows that behind the homosexual's unrighteous desire, there is concealed a legitimate need. And his desire is to meet that need with himself. It is not enough to run from God promising to act right. So many of us do that, don't we? He wants us to run toward him. Toward him and allow his power to transform our lives through grace, not through condemnation. Our answer always lies in running toward Jesus. The mature Christian does not say, I can do it on my own. 
The mature Christian says, I need Jesus to help me. The key verse that I'm using today is John 8, 31 through 32, working in concert with the fact that it says, and such were some of you. How did the people receive a change in their lives, a change in their hearts so their lifestyles changed? Jesus said to the people who believed in him, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings and you will know the, pro the truth and the truth will set you free. And friends, I said earlier, salvation is a process. There's a point where God gets a hold of us. I spoke with a young man recently who said, I don't believe in anything I can't see. And I said to him, when you have God introduce himself to you, you will know without seeing that he is real. Because we know inside. And he becomes as real to us as anything else. So today, the main point is this. The truth sets us free. It sets you and me free, and it sets the people out there free. But folks, we cannot convey that truth if we are believing falsehood ourselves. Every time you and I believe something that's not true, it hinders our effectiveness for Christ. Today we're going to examine six falsehoods that have been common in this topic in the three areas in which we find them most commonly. The first is this. Those myths, those falsehoods that are found in the church. And the first one is the belief that homosexuality is the worst sin. If you and I believe that homosexuality is the worst sin, we bring condemnation on others. And we have a, we have a pretty arrogant attitude. We should remember Romans 3.23, which says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of the Lord. Before Jesus and the cross, we are equals. Amen? They, the Bible does call homosexuality an abomination. But he says the same about haughty eyes. You know what haughty eyes are? Pride. Pride is an abomination. And I would dare say that there is no one in this sanctuary who does not need to be careful about pride. In other words, all of us need to be careful about pride. Pride has two faces. One face is, I can do it all. In fact, I'll do it instead of you because I know it'll get done the way I want it to. I'm the center of the universe. But the other face of pride is this. Well, I'm not worth anything. I'm the worst sinner in the world. No one can love me. That is the false humility, and that is another form of pride. So if you say, well, I'm not proud, let me live with you 24 hours, and I'll show you your pride. <laughs> and I don't say that with arrogance because I've shared with you past weeks how God shows me my pride. It should humble us. Amen? But it also says, he also calls an abomination a lying tongue. You ever color the truth? That's an abomination before God. Hands that shed innocent blood. <clears throat> Jesus said that it... Not only if you killed a man when you physically kill him, but when you hate him in your heart. When we harbor bitterness, and we wish someone were dead, we've committed an abomination, and God hates that. A heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies. Ooh, we better be really careful when we pass on that gossip, because that could be a lie. Don't pass on gossip. Don't pass on what you're hearing. Challenge it. Amen? God hates that. That's an abomination. And a man who stirs up dissension, another word for that would be division among believers, God hates that. In fact, that's one of those, that's one of the quickest ways, I'm sorry, let me back up. God deals with division and people who are divisive in the body very, very harshly. He says, warn them once, warn them twice, and then cast them out. So that is an abomination. Homosexuality is not the worst of all sins. When we, it's easy for us to think that it is because we use the word abomination to stand on how we feel because we see, many of us see it as revolting and revulsion. We're revulsed by it. Amen? Yes? 
but we have no ground to stand on to say that it's the worst. We should be honest about how we feel, but we cannot live by our feelings. We have to say, okay, I'm uncomfortable with this, but God loves the person as much as he loved me. So the discomfort is my issue. It's not that person's issue, which means I need to go to God. And I don't need to go to God to go to that person and say, I'm revolted by you. Don't go and tell people, well, I'm revolted by you. That in itself is a sin. Proverbs tells us, don't say everything that you're feeling. The fool expresses every emotion. We can tell God, but when we go out of our way to tell people, well, you've done this and this hurts me, we've sinned against God. The second falsehood promoted in the church is that homosexuality is a choice. It makes it sound as though I chose to put on a black shirt instead of a blue one. It makes it sound as though I can choose my sexuality. It makes it sound as though I can choose to be bald. Who over here has hair wants to be bald right now? I'll swap with you. <laughs> God let it be so. You, you who have hair don't know what it's like because your hair actually protects your head a little bit every time you hit your head. And I've learned, my head dents. Anyway, that's off. Homosexuality is not a choice. We learned last week it's multi-causal, which means there are a lot of factors that contribute to it. Most of, mostly, they're so integrated into our lives that, and it begins so young, at so young an age that children think that they were born that way. People don't feel, they don't choose to feel gay any more than you or I choose to feel straight. Those of us in this room who are willing to say, I wrestle with covetousness, wanting things, or I wrestle with pride, or I wrestle with lust, none of us would say, well, I asked for that, and I chose to have it, would we? Most of us would say, I'd rather not wrestle with pride, I'd rather not have lust, I'd rather not have this stinking thinking, we didn't choose that. We choose what we do with it, but we didn't choose to have those feelings, and the homosexual doesn't choose to have his or her feelings. Then another part of the homosexuality being a choice is Christians and Christian families are not immune. Children do need healthy parents. They do need a good upbringing to have a good chance of living a healthy life. But folks, we live in a fallen world. There is no family that does not have dysfunction. Every family has a degree of dysfunction. Every family, every individual is affected by sin in the world. The best of families, the best of families, the healthiest families can have people, can have children who grow up feeling attracted to the same sex. Self-perception is important. Personality plays a role. Self-perception is, am I really gay or not? And when we're in puberty or before, we wonder and we wrestle. And then the pressures from our peers, the labels they put on us, make us question ourselves even more. And I shared about my own experience last, year, last week. Never have had any same-sex attraction and yet was picked on so much and called a faggot and a fairy and queer so much when I was bullied that I, I questioned at one point, probably in middle school, well, am I gay and I don't know it? Alan Chambers writes this about his experience. I was a very confused kid. I hated sports, my dad, and I did not connect relationally. And I honestly perceived myself as more of a girl than a boy. I was different from my brothers and far more interested in being with my sisters and mom. Kids picked on, up on that and quickly labeled me a mama's boy, a sissy, and ultimately a fag. I didn't know what a fag was at first. When I found out, it struck me to my core confirming what I was becoming. By this time, I had been molested by an older boy. I desperately longed for male attention. I daydreamed about being a girl and having a boyfriend to spend time with. Yes, everything was set in motion for me to assume a gay identity. In reality, what I needed was what God created me to need, an affirming, character modeling, loving relationship with my dad. In fact, that's what my homosexual journey was always about, 
finding a man to love me. Sex was just a means to an end. Now, when some of us hear that, we think, well, Alan Chambers was a sick dude and needed counseling at a young age. Some of us feel that way. But I want to ask you something. If people could see what your thoughts were about, if there were a television screen right over your head, 24-7, and people could just look at it and knew what you had been thinking and feeling, how many of you would be ashamed and embarrassed to have them even get a glimpse of what ran through your mind? Now, because what you're thinking is so shameful and horrible to the rest of us, har, 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 does that mean you needed counseling at a young age because of those thoughts and feelings? We live in a fallen world and we're fallen creatures. Yes, some people need counseling. But you know what? We all have things inside us that we don't want anyone to know. And if you don't have, praise be to the Lord. Have you walked on water lately? <laughs> that was sarcastic. Please forgive me. So the church has not helped the cause of Christ in some regards. But society is the second area that we find promoting falsehood. The first area that we'll talk about is homosexuality is genetic. That is one of the falsehoods that's taught by society. I think in, at this time it's being emphasized less because of the way society has been transformed in its perspective on homosexuality. But saying that homosexuality is genetic is just an excuse. It doesn't make it right. No one has proven that homosexuality is genetic. Many of the studies that have been done have been poorly, poorly done. They've been biased. But there are some that cannot be discounted. What if it were true? What if it were true that homosexuality was genetic? Would that mean that genetic predispositions to behavior are the sole determinant of behavior? Does it mean that gen our genetics define how we act and who we are? There, are, there have been studies to try to prove that murderers have some genetic code, that murderers have something similar in their brains. If they find that, would we justify murder? See, science can never supplant God's word, never trumps God's word. Some have been freed from homosexuality. Well, if it were genetic, how could they be freed from it? We are all fallen creatures. If a gay gene, is, gay gene is found, homosexuality is still not an option. The fellow who wrote this, Alan Chambers and his staff, they point out that the misery that homosexuality brings does not trump the happiness found in Christ. If you listen to people who are homosexual, and when you hear them in honesty, often they will tell you, I wish I didn't feel this way. Environment does matter. Books about adoption, most states, most state about behavior that it doesn't matter what the genetic or biological predispositions of the child are because the environment the child is raised in plays a far more significant role in determining how the child will turn out. If we didn't believe that, those of you who have done foster care or have adopted, would you have adopted or would you go into foster care? Would you make the effort if you believe that genetics were just working against you completely? I don't think so. We believe that our, in, our influence can make a difference. Folks, your influence can make the difference in the lives of the people around you, whether they're homosexual or not. But it begins with what you believe to be true. Because if you believe a falsehood, you pe treat people differently. Isn't it true that there are times when we think someone is angry with us or irritated with us or done something against us, and we treat them differently because of that belief? And then one day we learn that we were wrong. And for all that time, we have mistreated them. It, in our mind, if not otherwise. And folks, if you think on it enough, sooner or later, you're going to mistreat them 
in other ways. Amen? Finally, no group would ever advocate for the special rights of alcoholics. The next falsehood that is promoted by society is that 10% of the population is gay. Studies, well, the studies done by Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s, he had a heavy bias, but it was not good research. But this 10% of the population being gay came out of his research in the 1940s. Actually, more accurate research between 1989 and 2000 and confirmed more recently in the late, well, as recently as 2013 from what I can glean and from uh, somebody who works in the field, professional therapist, a Christian, a fellow that I'm becoming acquainted with and one day may call a friend, he actually has a special anointing counseling homosexuals, it seems. He's, he's gone around with one of the leaders in a major city and had the fellow take him into gay bars. He confirms that the actual statistic is 2 to 3%. It's not 10%. But why, why would some people want us to believe that 10% of the population is gay? Why? Why such an exaggeration? I propose that one reason is it would make it seem more normal. And secondly, it would make it seem like it's not, it, it's more of an issue. It's, if so many people have it, we need to become more accepting. I don't know. 100% of us, though, are sinners, yes? The last two falsehoods, and there are probably more by now, but the last two aren't promoted just by the church. They aren't promoted just by society. I think they're part of general ignorance. And these are the ones probably that will affect you and me the most. Because they'll affect how we deal with people. It'll affect how we walk with them, the counsel we give them, what we try to get them to do. The first lie or falsehood is that homosexuality is all about sex. That is a falsehood. Homosexuality is not all about sex. It's actually about relationship and intimacy. Legitimate need for relationship that's being met in a wrong way. And a desire for intimacy. The greatest counterfeit of intimacy is sex. We see that with teen girls, probably older women too, but primarily teen girls is where I've seen it, where a teen girl wants affection. She wants to be loved. She wants to have intimacy with a boy. But intimacy means to be known and fully known and to be loved unconditionally and accepted. And the boy says, I'll love you if you give me what I want. And then he gets what he wants. He's more interested in the physical act. And she doesn't receive the kind of love and nurture that she's looking for. She feels used. Sex is a counterfeit to intimacy in a healthy relationship between a husband and wife. We can have both. But intimacy is more than sex. So homosexuality is not all about sex. That's a misdiagnosis. And the last falsehood is that marriage or dating will fix a homosexual. That is also a misdiagnosis. Anyone who's ever dealt with pornography, you know, young men grow up to be full-grown men, and they think, well, if I just get married, it'll be easy to let go of the pornography. Anyone who's ever been addicted to pornography knows that marriage does not fix the addiction. It's similar to that of homosexuality. Marriage or dating will not fix the homosexual. In both cases, there are underlying issues. And we're gonna, I'm going to present some of those underlying issues here shortly. The underlying issues need to be addressed. Anybody ever deal with a dry drunk? Dry drunk is somebody who has an addiction, they're alcoholics, and they stop drinking. But they haven't dealt with the underlying issues. Folks, dry drunk isn't much more pleasant than the drunk who's drinking. The underlying issues need to be dealt with. The people who go to jail for using drugs because they were committed a robbery. 
there are underlying issues. You can stop the addiction if you're fortunate, but it doesn't deal with the reasons that they were using drugs in the first place. Until you deal with the reasons they were using drugs in the first place, you've not solved the problem. And likely they'll go from addiction to addiction, the same with an alcoholic, the same with a homosexual. The underlying issues need to be dealt with. And it's really not quite so hard. Look at me. It's really not quite so hard. It's a matter of having relationship with a person and walking with him or her and not quitting on them and encouraging them. But that's next week's sermon. Christ needs to be the focus. Does Christ need to be the focus for the homosexual? Does Christ need to be the focus for anyone? Steve Gallagher started Pure Life Ministries down south. Ministry to men caught in uh, sexual addictions. And the men go there. It's an in-house program. They also have extension programs. But he tells them, and they tell them in that program, what looks to you like a mountain and overwhelming. Give us one year, and in that one year, we're going to turn our backs on that mountain, we're going to look to the cross the whole year. You just focus on Christ. And the more you focus on Christ, the better you'll be at the end of the year. You'll turn back to that mountain, and it will be a molehill. Rosaria Butterfield, who I've shared with you about the last couple of weeks, she the, was the PhD, the doctorate. She was a professor at SU. She was a, a feminist. She was a lesbian. She just detested Christians. She was invited by a pastor of the Reformed Presbyterian Church and his wife to dinner, and they built a relationship, and he did not preach at her, but showed her the love of Christ. Jesus made himself real to her, and in that process, she came, became aware of her underlying issues. And she began to wrestle with God, and he became so real to her in here, not because of what people were saying. What they were saying was, affirming her as a person, and it made fertile ground for Jesus to get a hold of her heart. She focused on Christ, and he transformed her, transformed her life. He did, step by step. It wasn't overnight. It wasn't just because she said a prayer of salvation. God did a huge work in her before she ever really believed and chose to surrender because she, he became so real to her before she became a believer. He became so real to her that it, became, it got to the point where she couldn't do anything but surrender to him. Am I right, Penny? Anything else I should add? And the, the amazing thing, the reason this sticks to me so much is that she was going to the church that we went to when we were first married. And we know some of the people that she talks about, and it's taking both Penny and me back to 30 years ago, early in our walk with the Lord. And no, I'm not going to become a Reformed Presbyterian, but... <laughs> a, ho a former homosexual can enjoy a wonderful marriage with great intimacy. However, marriage is not the means to freedom. It can be one of the joys of freedom. I want to share with you, just to summarize today's message and to lead into next week's teaching. This was published January 26, 2015 at 9.01 in the morning, if you're that interested in detail. The title of it is, For Years I Pleaded with God to Make Me Straight, So Why Did My Prayers Go Unanswered? Folks, what he's going to share in this, what I, I want you to hear it because his experience, Matt Moore is the writer, his experience, I think his parts of it are universal. Some of the things that he's going to say, you're going to say, that's true for me. I knew I was attracted to the same sex when I was seven, in some capacity anyway. I didn't think, I don't think it's physiologically possible to truly feel sexual attraction at such a young age. But I knew there was a drawing in me toward the same gender, and drawing that was more than what some would say is natural or normal. As I grew up in, rural, in a rural Louisiana town and teenage hormones began to surge throughout my body, my drawing toward the same gender intensified, sexually and emotionally. While I was definitely not engulfed in the life of a church during my adolescence, I was raised in close proximity, 
close enough proximity to religious things and religious people that I knew the Bible referenced homosexuality as an abominable thing. The Bible referenced to me as an abominable thing. So he understood that God saw homosexuality as an abominable thing, and because he felt same-sex attraction, he believed God saw him as an abominable thing. That was my understanding anyway, and not only did the Bible paint people like me in the light of all that is grotesque, but so did the people around me. Family, friends, football coaches, everyone. To be gay was to be gross. To be gay was to be wicked. To be gay was to be scum. So I prayed. Oh, how I prayed. God, make me normal. God, make me straight. God, make me like everyone else. But God didn't answer those prayers. Why? I hear my experience repeated by others all the time. Just yesterday, actually, a Christian friend of mine was conversing with a guy who was living a homosexual lifestyle. He pleaded with her to believe that he had prayed for years for God to make him straight, to no avail. She was speechless. She didn't know how to respond. Matt, why didn't God answer his prayer? I mean, he's prayed God's will. Why was there no answer? I'm not God. So I can't know all the reasons he wouldn't have answered this guy's prayers to be made attracted to women. But I do know what he's revealed in the Bible, and I do know what I now, as a believer in Jesus, believe to be true of my own unanswered prayers experiences. Finally, firstly, when I grew up pleading with God to make me straight, I had no real interest in God himself. I wasn't praying for God to do this because I loved him, or wanted to live my life for him. I was actually pretty unconcerned about him, to be honest. I wanted God to take away my same-sex desires for my own benefit so that I could fit in, be normal, be one of the guys, and even so that I could just have sex with girls like all of my friends were. So I obviously wasn't worried about being sexually moral. I just wanted to be sexually normal. My desire to be made straight was all about me. That you'll hear next week and during the life group's time. I had no interest in being reconciled to God or having a relationship with Christ. Which brings me to my second point. From what I see in the Bible, God is far more concerned with first fixing our hearts than he is with fixing other things in our lives. Same-sex attraction included. Yes, it's true that God hates homosexuality, but more than that, he hates that our hearts are opposed to him and that we long to live our lives separated from him. God's foremost desire is that we would come to him through Christ to receive new hearts that love and adore him. In fact, nothing can even begin to be done as far as the untangling of our sexualities until we receive new hearts that love and adore God. How do I know that? Because Romans 1 says that the whole reason homosexual desire even exists is due to our rejection of God's loving rule and authority over our lives. And then he shares a healthy portion of Romans 1, which I won't read. Homosexual desire and all other sinful desire exists in the hearts of people because worship of God does not. Did you hear that? Let me read it again for those of you who tuned out. Homosexual desire and all other sinful desire exists in the hearts of people because worship of God does not. In Adam, we corporately rejected the good rule of God over our lives. And in each of our hearts, we have all individually rejected the good rule of God over our lives. And what has been the result? God has given us over to ourselves. He gave us up to our sinful desire and has allowed us to revel and further deteriorate in it. So why didn't God answer my prayer to get rid of my homosexual desires? Because homosexual desires were not my main problem. They were a problem for sure, but the root of my problem was that I did not love God or worship Him. And my homosexual desires were just fruit of that, so to speak. God's des desire was to fix the root of my issues. And in 2010, He did just that. He opened my eyes to see that all that Jesus Christ is for those who will believe. I finally really saw Jesus as the Son of God who took on flesh and who in humility and incredible graciousness laid his life down for mine. 
He offered up his life to pay for my guilt in order that I could draw near to God and be given a new heart, a new heart that loves, adores, and worships the one true and incredibly good God. Am I straight now? Am I normal now? Am I free from same-sex desires and attracted solely to women? No, no, and no. My heart was changed instantaneously when I trusted in Christ and began to follow him, but my mind was not. I now have a heart that genuinely loves God and desires to worship Him. But at the same time, I'm still utterly messed up and damaged by sin. The Lord is working in me and renewing my mind day by day, shaping me more and more into the reflection of Him that I was created to be. But it's been a process. And it will continue to be a process until I receive a new, perfect, and sinless body in the age to come. When that day comes, the fullness of what Jesus purchased for me will be given to me. Full freedom from every sinful thing that restrains my enjoyment and worship of God. But even now, in this messed up, damaged flesh, I have experienced some change in my sexuality over the past four years. I can't deny that. And the shifting in my sexual desires is a direct result of my grace-given love for God. I've grown in my disgust of homosexual relations, because I see what a twisting and perversion it is of the image of God. And I've grown in my desire for women, specifically one woman, I wrote about it here, and maybe even in my desire for marriage, because I see how a one man plus one woman marital covenant so beautifully reflects the image of God. My growing desire for women is the overflow of a growing desire to see God's glory manifested in my life, plain and simple. I'm not saying that I'm definitely going to get married one day. I might not. I may be single and celibate for the remainder of my sojourning in this world, but either way, I will be fine and I will be joyful because my main problem has been fixed. Amen? I hate to just read you to death, and that's a lot of what I'm doing these three weeks, so forgive me and bear with it. But I thought it was better to come to him, from him directly. I couldn't summarize what he had to say. Would you stand with me, please?